Um, professor Strauss is a professor of sociology at the University of New Hampshire. Aaron, when did you and, uh, and, and Professor Strauss meet the first time? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Professor Strauss, it was a very, very important meeting in my life because I'd been struggling in England uh, at, at this first refuge in the world uh, in 1971, and nobody was listening, and everybody who did get involved were essentially extremely destructive. As far as the Church of England was concerned, Concerned, I was a marriage wrecker, and as far as the establishment in England was concerned, it wasn't really a problem. I was making it a problem. So I think, Professor Strauss, we met somewhere 74, 75, and it was such a relief to talk to three people who actually understood what I was talking about. There were three of us from England, and we were doing Eastern Seaboard to help set up refuges. Yes. Yeah, even before Under we met, when I, wrote, yes. when I wrote the introduction to Richard Gellis's book, The Violent uh, Home, yes. I mentioned your work uh, in establishing the first refuge and the, and the importance of it, not just for aiding those particular women, important as it was, but in establishing prevalence of this problem and the need to do something about it. And I remember particularly at that time my concerns because I ha had seen what was happening to us in England uh, with the split coming very in 74 actually between what I believe to be true which is family violence is generational and the feminist concept that domestic violence is gendered, that it's uh, the result of, of patriarchy. And I could see the damage that was going to be done if this concept of domestic violence was prevalent, which in fact it did become prevalent. It became actually across the Western world how people perceived domestic violence. And the tragedy for me is so many millions and billions of dollars have gone into this concept Whereas what we really need to look at, and that should have from the very, very beginning, is the effects on domestic violence on children as they are born, like I was, into one of these dysfunctional and violent families. Yes, if you take the definition of violence as physically attacking, uh, what in legal terms is called an assault, then they're approximately equal. And for young women, actually, the rate is higher of women assaulting a partner than for men, slightly higher. But generally across the board and across many nations, uh, it's about the same. If you take the def as the definition a physical attack, if you take this definition as injury, then on average, study after study shows that on average, women are injured more often than men and more seriously. Now that's average. There's of course many, many exceptions. Uh, and one does not contradict the other. Uh, critics of my research point this out as though it contradicted the fact that women assault as often as it does not. It just adds, not just, it importantly adds a dimension that also has to be considered, namely who comes out on the short end of things, and women more often than men do. That we now have on the line with us Allison Tiemann, a uh, senior editor at A Voice for Men, and also the host of uh, Honey Badger Radio. And I actually did have uh, something to say to uh, Mr. Strauss about his conclusion that women are more likely to be seriously injured. I'd like to point out that uh, studies have shown that uh, psychological injury can be just as severe with psychological violence as, uh, or the, the, um, the, uh, the psychological effects of verbal violence, the long-term psychological effects of verbal violence can be just as severe or is just as severe as physical violence. Yeah, in fact, probably even longer lasting. Uh, that at least is what my research on psychological violence shows. And it does show... 
What would you say the effects of this psychological violence, how do they manifest? Well, they manifest itself. The aspect of it that I uh, studied was depression and anxiety. And being assaulted by a partner increases the probability of depression and uh, anxiety. Now, it does it for both men and women. Men are attacked by their partners. And remember, we have to go back to just as many men are attacked by their partners as women. When men are attacked, it also increases the probability of depression and anxiety, but not as much. Really? I think that I think that's because women are more invested on average in relationships. So in a, something that undermines and attacks a relationship, hurts them more. But because women, because it's somewhat more harmful to women, doesn't mean it's not harmful to men. Uh, just like physical attacks, women may be injured more often, but lots of men are injured. We don't, we don't say, well, the disease B isn't worth studying because disease A is more harmful. Uh, we've got to attend to both. If I could uh, just interject here, I, I find it astounding that you're asserting that men are less invested in relationships than women, considering that when relationship breakup is, that's when men's suicide skyrockets and their depression. Well, I mean, and I'd also I'd point out that when you're talking about a group of people whose social role is to downplay their harm, like their, their sense of uh, vulnerability, I mean, don't you have to sort of account for the fact that every, you know, men are trained to man up and not admit to to issues and problems? Yeah, there are lots of different circumstances, but what the empirical research shows, and on average, women have more invested in relationships than men. Um, average can be very misleading because no one is average. There's always people above the average and below. And uh, so you have to take into account each case well, we do know from research that um, in the wake of divorce in particular, um, men are, about, are, are literally about 10 times as likely to suicide successfully. What I would say, <clears throat> and I take Alison's point, but I would actually say when a breakup occurs for men, and this is from my observations uh, of, of many, many suicides, obviously, in the work I've done, particularly as the women and the children were in the refuge, First of all, one of the reasons for the suicide, certainly, is there are no provisions for men. There are no refuges for men. There's nowhere for men to go. And men tend to invest themselves almost totally in their relationship with their family, the wife and the children, and their home. Whereas women have a much, much wider, I think, Murray, you're absolutely a much wider circle of invested relationships. So when the breakup occurs for men, they are completely isolated because one of the problems with the men is they do not get together when they are in trouble and are feeling weak. They are the, one of the problems for men is they're very heavily judged by each other. So my feeling is that one of the first things that we have to do is to make provision for men because nowhere in the Western world has it yet happened that man's role in domestic violence as a victim is properly recognized. Would you think that's true, Murray? Yes, I agree with that. In this country, that's uh, when a man, a man calls uh, the domestic violence hotline, he gets, he's most likely to get referred to a program for men who assault for yeah, matter. That's disgusting. Mm. It's just, you know, it's, it's horrible. Uh, so we, we urgently need that. And to get back to the main point, it doesn't, the issue isn't which one is hurt more. The issue that we agree on is that they are both hurt and we need to do something about that. It does, if one is hurt less than the other, doesn't mean we should pay less attention to that. But the fact that both are hurt is what we need to attend to. 
And also, I think we need to attend to the concept of if both adults are hurting each other, what on earth are they doing to the children? Because many of the people I deal with say, oh, well, the children weren't involved. Oh, yes, they were. Or hearing it. I mean, now, one of the things that I can tell you is that my childhood with the three, the three of us consisted of sitting in our beds or me sitting at the top of the stair, listening to the parents fighting and actually being absolutely terrified. And we didn't go downstairs because there wasn't anything we could do. But for, for, for children, that's the reality of the situation. Children, and, and we are the next generation of potentially violent and dysfunctional people. And I think that's been lost in all the politics of this movement. Yeah, it's not only lost, to a certain extent it's frowned upon or forbidden. Mm. I reviewed the research on children being exposed to violence between the parents. And almost all of it asks, only investigates whether the mother has been assaulted by the father. They yeah. don't into whether the mother also engaged in violence against the father, which happens in, which is the typical thing. In my research, about half the cases of children exposed to violence between the parents, all the parents were doing it. And in the remaining half, one quarter of the cases were only the mother. That's ignored yeah. in the research yes. and in the treatment programs. In fact, social workers get reprimanded if, if, not always, but frequently get reprimanded if they say, well, we have to pay attention to violence by the mother, not just the father. But I think we're talking about the wrong point. It's the point is not whether women are hurt more than men. It's that both are hurt, and we need to attend to both, and we need to stop the violence by women as well as by men. Yeah, but then the question becomes, why is there so much research into trying to make it women the, make the bigger victim? Like, why, why investigate? Like, why not just say, okay, well, this obviously is going to have negative effects on it. Why investigate that these negative effects are going to be larger for women than men? Why not just say, well, this is, this is violence, we need to stop it? Well, because I would say, Alison, there's a huge, huge uh, money problem behind all this, that all the money has been invested and, the, and women as victims has been established for the last 40 years. So all the programs that are funded, all the teaching that's funded, all the agencies, all the judiciary are all based on the fact that women are innocent victims of men's violence. And that is the been the political ideology for the 40 years and it's only people like Murray Strauss and Richard Gellis and Susan Steinmetz who unfortunately are dead who have been doing this research to, to finally prove what most of us working in the field have known all along that it is generational it's a complete waste of time but it had to be done all this research to actually prove that violence is generational because at the moment, the general public and everyone else, and above all, the people who actually are supposed to look after victims of both men, women, and children, have only been concentrating on women. And all along, it is the children that matter, because generational violence is from one generation to another. And if we could only establish that we would need to work on the generational violence, we could actually empty our prisons and our mental hospitals because the majority of people who are in there are battered and abused and sexually abused children originally.